Hi, this is Fish and welcome to Fish Picks. Today we'll be concluding our series on hard key impressioning by bringing together everything we've learned and attempting to create a working key for this Hastings cylinder lock. So let's get into it. This lock was sent to me along with a number of Yale cylinders and blanks by Martin Newton. I had the pleasure of watching Martin impression this lock in real time during a mentoring video call we shared a couple of months back, and he made short work of it, so I know it can be done, and Martin sent me the key he'd made along with this lock, so I've mummified the key for the purposes of this exercise, and then I'll compare them at the end, whether I'm successful or not. I prepared the blank ahead of time using the methods I covered in part one of this series. So I filed back the shoulder to reduce the chances of snapping the blank. I sanded the blade to a smooth neutral surface and then I performed my first core impression to identify the positions of the five pins, which I marked before filing shallow starter grooves. Now, on reflection, I think these should have been a little wider, as we'll come to see, but this preparation did save me a little time. So with this done, I worked the blank in the core a second time using the techniques we covered in part two, a series of controlled movements up and down whilst holding torque. And then I looked closely for marks, finding just one indicator mark at the front of the fourth notch. I know that I will typically take away the equivalent of one cut depth of material for every six strokes with my Swiss number four round file. So in this case, I performed that many filing motions and then checked my work before moving on to phase three. After my third impressioning operation, and there would be 12 in total, I identified marks at both positions four and five. Now notice here how important it is to roll the key to see the marks. The mark at position four under the microscope presents a large soft dark circle, while the mark at the fifth position is smaller and sharper, but it's hard to have them both present at the same time. But given that they were both clear indicators, I performed six file strokes for each of these notches on my blank. In phase four, I was presented with a mark at just position five, which this time was larger and more prominent, so I again carried out six more strokes. When I impressioned the core a fifth time, I initially thought I had no new marks, but when I looked more closely, I could see that the imperfection at the right tip of the fifth notch was now sharper, indicating that the key pin had perhaps bitten into the edge of the blank as I'd applied torque. Now, I've already removed a significant amount of material from this part of the blank, so I decided to perform more conservative four file strokes this time. As it turned out, this would prove unnecessarily cautious. In phase six, for the first time, I saw a really beautiful clear mark at position number three and a rounded pin mark again at the front of the edge of the fifth notch. So I performed six strokes on position three and an even more cautious two strokes on the last pin position before impressioning the core a seventh time. The results this time were similar, with the mark at three moving towards the front of the notch and five remaining on the very right hand edge but becoming slightly deeper and more prominent, so I repeated the same filing process, six strokes at position three and two at number five. When I then impressioned the core for an eighth time, the mark at three had moved forward again and to the right, a perfect little circular shallow crater, and the persistent fifth notch still presented a mark at the right hand edge of its notch. Now at this point, my focus on trying to get good filming angles caused me to lose focus on the impressioning process itself, and I've made a few silly errors. I had intended to perform six file strokes at the third position and just tidy up the end notch because I was already removing nearly all of the blade. As you can see though, I lost count. I performed seven strokes at the third notch and my angle after the third or fourth stroke is completely off the ideal perpendicular line so that I'm biting into the right hand edge of the blank whilst neglecting the middle and the left. 
Thankfully, none of these errors proved catastrophic, but it's a useful reminder that impressioning requires vigilance and attention to detail. At this stage, I was a little concerned that I might have some canyoning which could interfere with the smooth movement of the key in and out of the cylinder, so I used my flat file to take the tips of the peaks away before impressioning the core for the ninth time, and as you can see here, it looks like a much more even profile. When I impressioned for the ninth time, I saw no markings at five, but there was a nice clear mark at the front of the third notch. So this time I decided to employ just four strokes because I felt that the size and position of this mark indicated that I was getting closer to the target depth. Here you can see the consequences of my sloppy filing with the slice I've taken out of the middle right edge of the blade. Sure enough, following the tenth impression, I revealed an indicator mark for the first time on the first pin. Notice here that the pesky number five has come back to haunt me, but believe it or not, I didn't notice this at the time. So I performed six strokes on the first notch, completely ignored the fifth, and then re-impressioned. This footage from the microscope was, I think, the least successful because while you can clearly see the mark left at position number one, you can't really make out that there's also a mark at the second position. This is because it doesn't sit in the crater notch that I made, but just in front of it, which is why I think I needed to use wider starter notches in the future. Note also the V gash at the bottom of the third notch where my file strokes clearly weren't perpendicular. These errors are all indications of how new impressioning is to me, and I'm sure I'll get more precise as time passes. It's okay to screw up as long as we learn from our mistakes, right? At this point I was feeling more movement in the core when I applied torque and I felt that I was coming close to achieving an open so I reduced the number of file strokes to just four in each of these places and sure enough my instincts were right because when I started to apply torque for the twelfth impressioning within the core the key actually turned, albeit stiffly, to the open position. When I inspected the blade after opening and locking the cylinder a few times, there was a beautiful deep mark in position one. As a general rule, the deeper the impression, the closer to the correct bitting you are. Because all the other notches have the correct height to take the key pins to the shear line, all of the torque and pressure was being directed to this one remaining pin, and so it stands to reason that the mark made will be more prominent but it would be a mistake at this stage to take away a full cut's worth of material again because we do already have an open, so I performed just two file strokes here and decided to tidy up my fifth notch nemesis a little more before retesting the smoothness of the key turn. I realised at this point that some of the tightness was a consequence of the way the cylinder was being clamped in place because when I released the pressure, allowing the tail of the cylinder to move more freely, I could turn the key with very light thumb and finger pressure. So, I had successfully impressioned a working key. If I've kept count correctly, I think I performed 68 or 69 file strokes during the 12 operations to arrive at this bitting profile. But when I came to compare my keys to Martin's, I got an unexpected surprise. While there are similarities, there are clear differences too, particularly when it comes to the fourth cut, which looks to be way out. The first thing I did was to gut the lock to see if there was a master pin in play, which might lead to two shear lines at that point, but no. This is what I found inside, five standard pin stacks with nothing that might immediately account for the anomalies. So next, I took a photograph with a side-by-side -side comparison of the two bitting profiles and then took that information into a graphics program, duplicated the keys and then overlaid them. And as we can see, I've come close to replicating Martin's impressioning solution at every point except for that fourth notch. But I think I have a solution. I mapped out five vertical lines, each representing a pin stack, and when I centred these to each notch, we can clearly see that we have a problem, but if I then bring those pin stacks back just a millimetre or so, a different picture emerges. Now the pins still sit in each of the notches, but at this point the differences at the fourth stack are far less dramatic, and I suspect that it's this which explains why both keys can still open the same lock although I'd welcome comments if you have any other ideas. So there you have it, a practical demonstration of the principles and techniques we've covered in this mini-series. 
I hope you feel empowered to try impressioning for yourself. It's a lot of fun and very satisfying. Thanks again to Rubber Band and Martin Newton for all the support I've received. And thanks to all of you for continuing to watch and comment so enthusiastically. Until next time, take good care.